the light has gone, but I still work. <laughs> ah, isn't that what you do? I mean, when the light is gone, it's dark, right? Like the SR3 Dart from EVGA. This is a socket 3647 board. This is the top of the line, the best of the best of the best. After the fall of human civilization and the earth is cracked apart and a neighboring alien civilization comes to do archeology, span they'll find a chunk of earth where there's still a computer based on this motherboard that's still running. It doesn't get any more expensive than this on the Intel side. These two things, this processor and this motherboard, $5,000 US. This is a, an exceptionally expensive computer. <laughs> now, if you just consider Intel, the $3,000 W3175, it's actually quite a bargain. If you were to buy this in a server configuration where you're gonna have like a two socket configuration, that is going to be a $10,000 per socket proposition from Intel. That's the Xeon Platinum uh, 8120. And then later, you know, there's some revisions and some hardware mitigations for some of Intel's security issues. This is the W3175, which was released to the general public in, in early 2019. We actually saw this 2018 Computex, like the, the plan for it. It was like, it's gonna be out by Christmas. They're a little late. These are available in general retail at this point. And at least as of this video, Intel's website will actually give you one mulligans if you accidentally kill the CPU. So it's the Intel premium protection thing that's on their regular K series processors. Well, this is the W3175X. Has the distinction of being the only overclockable Xeon. We've done some videos on this before and other socket 3647 motherboards. There's only really two that can handle the wattage of this thing because when you overclock this, it uses a lot of electricity. I mean, we saw it with a one horsepower chiller that is not even really, it's hard to get it in America because of environmental regulations, because boy howdy, that chiller. So uh, we can dump up to 600 watts through this CPU and that's what we're gonna do. So building a system around these components, easily gonna set you back 10 grand or more, depending on what you wanna do. But uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's unpack this and then let's do a build. I, I really kind of dig EVGA's minimalistic box packaging, but I think there should have been like small print in a corner somewhere to tell you exactly what you're getting. But you know, a lot of these really expensive motherboards, they got the thing that flips open and, and you know, you can, EVGA doesn't need any of that. That's pretty cool. The installation quick guide from EVGA. That is a hefty motherboard. It's like four pounds of motherboard. Pretty crazy, really. It's in the swanky EVGA anti-static bag, so you know, never get it mixed up. But also in the in the box, you get this. It's another motherboard. This is the base plate. See this? This is uh, a version of the motherboard that shows you the physical layout of the board, but this can also be used for a test bench. So in the box are little standoffs. You can put the motherboard here and uh, do your work, do your testing, you know, test bench overclocking, whatever you might wanna do with this little mini sort of in the box test bench. This is really, it doesn't cost EVGA a lot of money. And this is pretty good in terms of a reference for showing you, you know, what different things do. So you can see there's a table here. If you're gonna do extreme overclocking, you can hook your test probes up to that. And then, you know, use this as a handy reference. There's also a reference here for status LEDs and some of the other stuff on the board. This is great because, I mean, EVGA knows their audience. They're gonna be selling to liquid nitrogen overclockers and day traders. How's it going, day traders? Turns out there's a lot of you in my audience. I know because I fixed a lot of motherboards, a lot of socket 3647 motherboards. So thank you for your support. And uh, yeah, your your low latency transactions with 28 cores. Sure, yeah. We're, that's why we're taking a look at this motherboard. So thanks. When you look at it in this, I mean, you really understand just how many pins your CPU has. That's socket 3647, six memory channels, a lot of PCIe layouts, et cetera, et cetera. They also provide in the box probe breakout connectors. So at the top edge of the motherboard, there are more connections that you can use for board level diagnostics in terms of VCC in, what's your voltage, what's your V-core voltage, is there a drop? 
EVGA gives you the connections that you need to plug in a multimeter or whatever level of monitoring that you wanna do at the top edge of the motherboard. EVGA knows exactly the kind of overclockers they're gonna be dealing with in terms of support. So the included USB key can be inserted into the internal USB 2 connection and that is how you can recover the BIOS. Even though we have triply redundant BIOSes, you can still recover the BIOS. Good job, EVGA. Now, unlike the other Socket 3647 boards on the market, this one comes with built-in liquid cooling. Yeah, this is a VRM block. So you're gonna still need a block for your Socket 3647 CPU, but this block for the VRM and the chipset is built in. Now, if you're not planning to liquid cool, as long as you have ample airflow over this area, it is still connected to this metallic block that you see here on either side of the water cooling option. So this still will deliver adequate power to the CPU, even for a fair bit of overclocking. It's just that if you're going to be dumping, you know, a thousand watts into your CPU for that one horsepower chiller, you're gonna to wanna to connect your liquid cooling block. In terms of motherboard connections for power, we have the standard ATX24 pin, and then we have four eight pin connectors. Now each one of these can deliver up to 400 watts, so that's 1600 watts of 12 volt power for the CPU. There's an additional six pin connection here at the edge of the motherboard, and that's to supply additional power for your PCI Express layout. I also think that EVGA has got one of the best PCI Express layouts for this kind of board because this board is large, but not super oversized, and you're still able to access all of the PCI Express lanes that the Xeon CPU offers for you. You know, there's another version, there's another Socket 3647 motherboard that only has four slots. So, not an ideal situation. We've got three U.2 connections and two M.2 connections, so you can run your M.2, even an M.2 RAID on board. VROC is, of course, supported because, you know, the Intel platform. We've also got onboard USB 2.0, so if you're gonna, you know, use this as a quasi-server platform, looking at you day traders, then you can boot your operating system off of USB and then do whatever you need to. I mean, there's some of those guys that seem to just run like one or two cores with a crazy overclock just for lower latency, single core processing. It's a very odd use case. We also have six SATA, six gigabit per second ports at the front edge of the motherboard, a giant mechanical BIOS switch and including a socketed BIOS chip. So you can select between primary, secondary and tertiary BIOS. Yes, this is a three position selector switch. So you can use three possible switches. Now in terms of PCIe layout, again, EVGA has done something unusual here in the Socket 3647 market. This is a PCI Express by 16 slot and it is wired for PCI, PCI Express by 16, but it will operate in by 16 or by eight mode. This slot is the same. It's, it's wired for PCI Express by 16, but it will operate in PCI Express by 16 or by eight. The slot will operate in PCI Express by eight, this slot will operate in PCI Express by 16 or by eight. This one will operate only in PCI Express by eight. And the bottom slot will operate in PCI Express by 16 or by eight. Now there's a lot of PCI Express switches that are in the mix there because strictly speaking from that 3175, you're only talking about, I think 48 PCI Express lanes maximum. Now there are some chipset lanes that are coming off of that. So we need a block diagram to really fully understand what we're, what we're looking at in terms of PCI Express layout. But in terms of being able to run a lot of peripherals and connectivity, that sort of thing, these are all by 16 or by eight slots. So you could run, <laughs> you could convert your U.2 into more PCI Express sockets. I don't recommend it, but you could do that. But this would let you run a lot of relatively high speed peripherals if that's your thing. Another unusual feature of this board is exposed pogo pen pads. What's a, what's a pogo pen pad? These little gold connections. So you basically have a test apparatus that you could 3D print or you know they'll have one that's actually been properly made. And there's little spring loaded gold pens on it. And if you just physically fit that onto the motherboard in just the right way, these test points give you all kinds of data about what's going on at a board level with your motherboard. So if you're into that kind of thing, you can build a test fixture that'll just slap right on this motherboard, hit those pogo pins, and give you information about voltage, current, whatever else you're looking for, whatever they've provided an interface for on the pogo pins. At the rear of the motherboard, we have 10 USB connections, eight USB, three, five gigabit ports, and two USB 3 10 gigabit ports, one type A and one type C in the 10 gig variety. We also have dual Intel NICs. Yeah, X550, my favorite high-end NIC, as well as an Intel, you know, the built-in Intel NIC. So three NICs total on this board. We've also got the Soundcore 3D Creative Labs sound implementation, which has an optical SPDIF port. 
And you might be wondering what we're gonna put it in. Well, I just snapped it. This is the Lee and Lee Dynamic XL, because XL, brr. You do need a special bracket on the side, for these oversized motherboards. This one is, is no different. Fortunately, it comes with a, uh, a board that you can use to make sure that it's gonna fit properly. Now, DeBauer, if you're listening, it would be cool to have a cutout, a version of the motherboard bracket that has a cutout for this motherboard so your cables can be even more hidden. DeBauer really knows how to make a dang fine case. And also Lee and Lee. I mean, Lee and Lee put it together, but DeBauer, good job. The worst thing about this case is that it doesn't have any sound dampening, so you just have to use really high-end fans. And uh, we're gonna be using Noctua. I don't care. What about the brown? Well, you can get black Noctua fans now, but I need like a billion of them. So yeah, I got the brown ones. It's fine, it's fine. Also, I got to plan my tubes. Got the flexible tubes. They do a little bit better job. Oh yeah, the next thing you should be wondering is, don't I need two power supplies for this monster? I mean, you could if you're gonna go chiller, but. <laughs> this was on sale at Newegg. It was $115. When you're spending $5,000 on a motherboard and CPU, you really should not be spending $115 on a power supply. And yes, while uh, the, uh, the motherboard was sent by EVGA, that is a retail $3,000 CPU. I sort of traded some stuff for it, but it was not a sample in any way. So one thing that's super annoying about the package with the Hercules 1600 is that it only has two eight pin connectors. Not to worry, I have a fix for that. This thing, this thing is the thing that makes you wish for Radio Shack. So it takes two eight pin PCIe power connections, which are not the same pin out and converts it into an eight pin CPU power connection. So the CPU power connection, that's actually a lot more common in server applications. So two GPU power plugs, eight pin on this side to one eight pin CPU power connector on this side. Wouldn't be my build if I didn't have at least some mustard colored cables. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. Mounting your pump, that's a you problem. Sometimes where you wanna put your pump doesn't always work. Sometimes you gotta make your own destiny. Do not drill a hole in the motherboard. Drilling a hole in the solid metal of the case is fine. In my case, I wanna mount the, the D5 pump here, sort of near the top so I can pop the glass off and then I can just unscrew the top and fill it or drain or whatever it is that I would like to do, but there's not really an easy way to mount the pump. Now in the pump mounting kit for the Dynamic XL, there is a bracket and you can mount the bracket and do all that kind of thing, but it's a little awkward with the, um, the motherboard thing, the motherboard, the extra large motherboard standoff thing for this case. Well, that's it. Well, that's not it actually, but we're ready to test power on. I got the pump primed, get the soft tubing routed reasonably well. I get the pump mounted in a custom sort of way that's not super janky. And I've got my EVGA Velcro to show off the pump. Now this is an EKD5 pump to be sure, and I'm using EK fittings. I've got a pretty high-end Hardware Labs radiator in the top. I think if I'm gonna do GPU cooling in this CPU, I really need two radiators. So I'll probably add a second radiator at the bottom. Even if I were gonna do something like hardline tubing, I always hate the hardline tubings that uh, I have the tubes that go across the memory because it makes it hard to do servicing. But I mean, as often as I'm juggling hardware to try different things or see how a Linux distro is broken or see why FreeBSDs, or I'm sorry, FreeNAS's installer is broken on certain Threadripper motherboards, but not other ones, I'm juggling hardware a lot. So hardline is probably not gonna make sense for me <laughs> unless somebody just comes and is like, here, let's do this super amazing build, which might actually be happening because we have some super fans. Thanks, you know who you are. Now with a power supply with this many watts, it can fail catastrophically. And it's the most exciting type of catastrophic failure that you might encounter because 1600 watts. Some cool features about this motherboard that I discovered, there's no RGB, there's also no USB-C, and there's only one 30 pin front panel USB header. So if I'm gonna use my second set of USB 3 ports, cause the Dynamic XL has four USB 3 ports, so I can use two of them, plus also USB-C, can't use two of my USB 
five gigabit ports or my USB-C port, unless I get an add-in card or something like that. But hey, tons of PCI Express connectivity, not a problem. I was also not 100% sure how I wanted to route the fluid flow over the VRM. Do I wanna hit the chipset first and then sort of go against gravity up across the VRM? Because the chipset is going to be cooler than the VRM. So the CPU gets its heat load first and then the chipset and then the VRM and then it's off to the rad. I think if I were doing this with a dual radiator setup, I would probably go from the pump to uh, the CPU to a rad, to the motherboard, to the graphics card, to another rad, back to the pump. But that's just me. I did the EVGA Auto OC robot and it immediately clocked the W3175 up to 4.5 gigahertz. Not bad. Well, with the system working pretty well and the Auto OC robot taking me to 4.5 gigahertz, now that's on a cold loop. So I think that with several hours of stress testing, we may end up backing that off. I may end up adding that second radiator, even though I don't have the GPU block sooner rather than later. But there's a lot of other cool features in EVGA's BIOS that I wanna call attention to. One of them shows you what PCI Express connection you've got for all of your devices, whether it's by eight or by 16, what your devices are, NVMe. Some of it is standard fare for other board vendors, but EVGA has obviously spent a lot of time organizing the features and making sure that it's as user-friendly as possible. Doing the stress test, as well as auto overclocking in the BIOS, that's pretty cool. We, that's not really a new feature. That's sort of been there on EVGA board since, gosh, I think I've got an X99 board that has that feature. And uh, yeah, so let's get this over to the test bench and do some more testing. Well, let's get this thing buttoned up and then let's get it over to the test bench and do some more testing. We got the system put together. It's stable, it's rocking, it's pretty awesome. Kabauer knows how to make a case. This thing's worked out really well. I got the Hardware Labs radiator. Now, officially this one 360 millimeter radiator is rated 1600 watts. I could push 1200 through it. Very respectable 4.5 gigahertz all core overclock. Does seem to be stable, although my temperatures are floating around 90 degrees C, which is a little warm for my taste, but I can do some tuning on this and probably get it to be a little bit better. I am gonna add that second rad. Probably not gonna go hard line. I like my soft line tubing. 3D printed some standoffs so that, uh, you know, the tubing maybe looks a little neater with some 3D printed clips. Maybe I can make the angles a little bit more right with like elbows and stuff that are 3D printed. I'm surprised nobody's actually done that before. Big thanks to EVGA for sending me the SR3 Dark. I like it. It's a solid motherboard. Doesn't have an RGB header. There's really no BS on this motherboard. I don't like that it doesn't have USB-C or an extra, you know, set of USB connections, but it's got so many PCI Express slots that that's not really a big deal. This build is solid. It's remarkably stable. The UEFI has all the features that you would expect. This is also an amazing experience on Linux. I mean, I'm doing some benchmarks on Windows, but this machine is probably gonna be a Linux machine because it's so stable at 4.5 gigahertz. I can run all the virtual machines and all the pass through that I can stand. Really the worst thing is this 350 watts of standby current. Nominal, running a test like this, it's like eight, 900 watts. Peak, 1200 watts. Definitely gonna need another rad if I'm gonna push past 1200 watts. All in all, this is not this is not a bad setup. This isn't a crazy, if you were to build a system like this and actually add some good storage like the P4500 with the U.2 connections, 10 grand, 12 grand, something like that, it's crazy. I don't know if I'll be able to hang on to this setup for a long time, but I'm hoping I'll be able to use this setup for uh, benchmarking and testing and stuff like that for a long time to come. I think I will be able to do that because EVGA sent me a motherboard and I don't have to return any of the other parts, most of the other parts I bought. So I think this is gonna work out really well as a, as a, as a good test system. Plus, Maybe there's 3647 CPUs that are coming down the pike, other than the 3175X. I mean, there's the 3275 non-X. It's $4,000 though, this is 3,000. I said too much. I'm Wendell, this is level one, I'm signing out. If you wanna do a build like this, come to the forum, I'll help you.